Today, we're going to go over what to do in the optimization process if you're GPU bound. Let's go. All right, in episode four, we talked about how to find out if you're CPU bound or if you're GPU bound. And then last week, we went over what to do if you're CPU bound. Today, we're going to look at what to do if you're GPU bound. If you haven't seen the previous videos in the series, I've linked the playlist down below so you can catch up. If your project is GPU bound, it means that the graphics chip is doing more work than the CPU. The CPU is idle when it's done with its work while it waits for the GPU to finish. Because game graphics are typically complex, this condition is the most common. Before you start optimizing, it's more likely that you're GPU bound. So hopefully we'll go over some information today that will be useful. Before we jump in, I want to give you an idea for what's coming next in the series. Next week, I'm going to show you how to use analysis software called PIX to analyze your game's graphics and see what operations are taking the longest. And then in the following weeks, we're going to get into the specifics of how to apply these in Unreal and in Unity to improve your performance. I'm really looking forward to exploring these topics with you. Okay, so when you're GPU bound, there are generally two categories of things that can cause the problem. Either you're geometry bound, meaning your scene has too many triangles, or you're pixel bound, which means it's taking too long to calculate the color of each pixel on the screen. So I'm gonna break down these two situations separately. In episode three, we talked about discovering the capabilities of your graphics hardware. And I mentioned that one of the tests you should do on your hardware before you start your project is to find out how many triangles it can draw before it starts dipping below your target frame rate. This is where that information is useful. If you know that you're GPU bound, the next thing to do is take a look at the polygon count for your scene. If your polygon count is high, like over the limit you discovered in your initial testing, then you're probably geometry bound and you need to focus your optimizations on reducing the number of triangles being drawn. But if your polygon count is below the limit, then you're pixel bound and you need to find ways to reduce the cost of rendering the pixels. So let's go over each of these two scenarios. If the polygon count is high and you're GPU bound, you may need to do further analysis to discover which objects are contributing the most to the problem. But there are a few things you can try before going deeper. Many of the items we talked about last week in episode five, when discussing being CPU bound with high draw calls also apply here because preventing objects from drawing also reduces the overall polygon count. So I recommend going back and looking at those things first. Specifically, that would be occlusion culling, level layout, and early distance culling. Those would all be methods of drawing fewer objects in your scene, which would obviously reduce the polygon count. Next, let's talk about LODs. All of the objects in your scene need LODs, unless they use more than around 50 triangles or so. LODs are copies of the mesh that are simplified. LOD 0 is the highest resolution version. LOD 1 will have about 50% fewer triangles than LOD 0. LOD 2 will have about 50% fewer, fewer triangles than LOD 1. And that pattern will continue until your last LOD is less than 100 triangles or so. The game engine will switch between these copies of your mesh based on the distance from the camera or the object size on the screen. So if there are objects in your scene with high polygon count that don't have LODs, make LODs for them and make sure the engine is switching between the LODs correctly. 
If all of your objects have LODs and LOD switching is working correctly, but your polygon count is still too high, the next thing you can do is adjust the distances where those LODs switch. Make them switch to the lower detail meshes a little bit closer to the camera. There's a bit of a balancing act here because the lower detail meshes don't look as nice and the closer to the camera the switch happens, the more obvious it is. So you have to do careful tuning to find the sweet spot where performance is improved and the switching isn't too jarring. Some game engines have a system that blends or fades between the LODs, so that's something that you could also try. As a last resort, if your scene has meshes that just use too many triangles, you can set those meshes to skip LOD 0 and start with LOD 1 or LOD 2 instead. That's kind of a drastic measure, but it's sometimes necessary. I've noticed that meshes that come from services like Megascans often include an LOD0 that has a pretty ridiculous number of triangles. And that's because they want you to have a hero version that you can zoom in really close to, or the assets are intended to be used in film where performance doesn't matter. If you get assets from outside sources, Take a close look at them before you put them into your game and make sure that they fit into the budgets that you set for your project. You may need to leave out the highest levels of detail to prevent your scene's polygon count from exploding and reducing your frame rate. Just a quick side note here, uh, Unreal uses Nanite, which is a different type of system for managing triangle count instead of LODs. I'll get into some specific things you can do to reduce triangle count in Nanite in a future episode. Alright, so the most obvious reason to use LODs is to help keep the triangle count low in your scene. But there's another important reason. Quad overdraw. To help you understand what this is, I need to explain a little bit about how graphics hardware works. We generally think of graphics hardware as drawing pixels, but the way that the hardware is set up, the smallest unit that the hardware can draw is a set of four pixels called a quad. So in order to render a triangle on the screen, it's broken down into these quads and the quads that contain that triangle are drawn. At the edges of the triangle, there are some quads where only one of the four pixels contains a part of that triangle. These edge pixels are still drawn even though they don't contain anything because they're part of the quad where at least one pixel contained the triangle. This is quad overdraw. It's not so bad when the triangles are large because most of the quads are either inside or outside of the triangle and only a few around the edges have this problem of pixels being wasted. But what happens when a triangle is the size of a pixel, or maybe even smaller? Three vertices are being transformed for the triangle, and four pixels are being drawn, but only one pixel is actually needed. And if you have another triangle right next to it that's the same size, this same quad of pixels has to be drawn all over again for that triangle. This is a major waste. If there are a lot of triangles this size on the screen, we end up drawing each quad multiple times, one for each of the triangles, and this can quickly increase GPU cost without improving the visuals at all. So this is quad overdraw, and while LODs are great at managing scene triangle count, the real reason that we use them is to ensure that we don't have triangles that are smaller than pixels on the screen so we can avoid quad overdraw. There's a great video that goes into more depth on this topic that I'll link down in the description if you want more details. It's pretty easy to check for this problem. If you switch to wireframe mode in your scene and then fly around, check for areas where the wireframe is really dense. These are areas where you might consider switching to less detailed LODs sooner to prevent quad overdraw. All right, now let's talk about lighting. 
The number of lights in your scene and the size of the light sources can have a big impact on performance. Most engines have a debug view where you can check the complexity of the lighting in your scene. You can use this view to find hotspots where lighting is a major contributor to performance problems. In a forward renderer, every object that the light source touches incurs additional rendering costs. Some renderers actually render the object multiple times, once per light, so that can increase the scene's polygon count significantly, especially if there are a lot of lights. In a deferred renderer, the larger the light source is on the screen, the more costly it is. In both forward and deferred renderers, you can reduce rendering costs by reducing the number of light sources overall and by reducing the size of existing lights. If you reduce the light's attenuation distance, radius, and cone angle, the light will be cheaper to render. You can also save performance by turning off shadow casting for some lights. Rendering shadows from point lights can be expensive because point lights require re-rendering the scene as a cube map with six sides from the point of the view of the light source. If you need shadows, see if it's possible to convert the point light to a spotlight instead. Rendering shadows from spotlights is cheaper because it's just re-rendering the scene in one direction instead of six directions. But obviously, it's cheaper to turn off shadows for the light, so only enable shadows for light sources that absolutely need them. And once again, I need to do a bit of a side note here for Unreal. In Unreal, it's possible to enable Mega Lights, which is a system that uses ray tracing to optimize the way that lights are rendered. Mega Lights has, a, has very different rules for what makes the lights expensive. So pretty much everything we just talked about doesn't apply when using Unreal's Mega Lights. We'll get into more specifics on that in a future video. All right, now let's switch over and talk about what to do when you're GPU bound, but your polygon count is below your budget. This generally means that the GPU is pixel or fill rate bound instead of triangle bound. There are a couple of different things that could cause this and some fairly straightforward solutions, so let's discuss them. Post-processing costs are one potential cause. The GPU does a lot of other things in addition to just rendering the triangles in the scene. Anti-aliasing, screen space ambient occlusion, depth of field, screen space reflections, subsurface scattering, and motion blur are all examples of what I would consider post-processing costs. Take a close look at these features. Try turning them on and off and see what they actually contribute to your scene. If they're not doing much for you, turn them off to save on performance. Many of these features also have settings that you can adjust. If you need the feature, you might be able to reduce its cost by turning down the settings. We'll take a closer look at some specifics here when we start optimizing our scenes in Unreal and Unity in a future video. Overdraw may also be an issue in your scene. When opaque meshes are rendered, only the mesh closest to the camera is rendered, and so the pixels on the screen only need to be rendered once. This is the most efficient. But when transparent objects are rendered, the meshes behind them must be rendered first, and then the transparent objects in front are rendered afterward, so that the objects behind them can be seen through the transparent objects in front. This means that the pixels on the screen must be rendered multiple times, first for the opaque background objects and then again for the transparent foreground objects, in order to determine their final color. This is called overdraw, and it can be costly, especially on weaker hardware. Overdraw is especially costly when the scene is filled with many transparent objects or when particle effects use hundreds of transparent billboard particles that layer on top of each other. Because overdraw is expensive, most game engines have a viewport rendering mode 
specifically for finding overdraw problems. It represents the number of times a pixel on the screen is drawn with a gradient. Sometimes it's black and white where black is 1 and white is 10 or more, or it might be a rainbow gradient. When switching into this mode, it's easy to tell where an overdraw hotspot areas are because they're usually white on the screen. If your scene is rendering slowly because of overdraw, there are a couple of things you can do to fix the problem. For particle effects, you can reduce the overall size of particle billboards and reduce the number of particles used. Fewer overlapping transparent particles means less overdraw. For some types of meshes, such as foliage, you may consider using an opaque shader instead of a transparent one. Enabling alpha clipping on the opaque shader will allow you to get cut out shapes without paying the cost for overdraw. When objects do require transparency, enable alpha clipping with a low threshold so that areas that are 100% transparent get clipped before they contribute to overdraw. Finally, I want to talk about dynamic resolution scaling or DRS. Many game engines have the ability to dynamically scale the rendering resolution based on the current frame rate. So if the frame rate is too low, they can automatically drop the resolution to help improve performance. This does reduce the quality of the whole image, however. So this feature should only be used after every other technique has been applied and the game has been optimized as much as possible in other ways. Dynamic resolution scaling should not be considered a magic solution to fix performance issues automatically without putting in the effort to optimize the game as much as possible before enabling it. But it can make the frame rate more consistent and steady, especially when performance spikes occur. So it's a good feature to turn on just be sure to always turn it off when measuring performance because it will completely throw off your results and hide performance problems. Only turn on DRS for your final builds. All right, I know we didn't go over shader optimization today, but I do want to call it out as another major way to improve performance if you're GPU bound. If your scene is using complex shaders, you can get a major GPU performance boost by optimizing the shaders. We're going to spend a full episode in this series talking specifically about that, maybe even multiple episodes, but I just wanted to mention it here so you, didn't, so you know I didn't forget about it. Anyway, that about does it for today. If you know of additional ways of improving game performance when you're GPU bound, please put them down in the comments. As I said, Next week, we'll be taking a look at how to analyze your game's performance using picks. That's going to be a great one, so be sure to come back for that. Thanks a lot for watching, and have a great week.